Lois Nadine Smith came from humble beginnings. She was a preacher's daughter from rural Oklahoma. But as she grew up, she developed a hard reputation. Miss Smith was well known in the county as, as mean Nadine. You know, she was meaner than any man. A lot of people feared her. Nobody would mess with her, and she would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any person and duke it out if she had to. By the age of 41, Nadine Smith was a divorced mother of three, living a life far removed from her religious upbringing. She abused substances. She could party for days. Her 18-year-old son, Greg Smith, also partied hard, and the police suspected he was involved with illegal drugs. Greg had been dating 21-year-old Cindy Bailey, but they'd recently split up. On the morning of the 4th of July, 1982, Nadine and her son Greg set out to confront his former girlfriend. She possibly was turning state's evidence on what their illegal activity was. It had something to do with drugs. We also heard that perhaps she may have attempted to set Greg up to be murdered. The police are not sure exactly why Cindy was targeted, but that morning, Nadine, Greg, and his new girlfriend, Teresa Baker, drove to a local motel where Cindy Bailey was staying. Nadine had been up all night drinking may have been taking some drugs. I asked Miss Bailey if she wanted to go partying with them, and she said yes, so she got in the car with them. As the four drove towards Gans, Oklahoma, the mood in the car turned nasty. Nadine accused the frightened girl of plotting to have her son Greg killed. Cindy denied the rumor. Nadine Smith told Cindy Bailey that she would never see Cherokee County again. She put on some black gloves, and began to choke Cindy Bailey. She took a knife and stuck it into the neck. She had twisted the knife while it was stuck in her flesh in an attempt to torture her. The group drove Cindy to the home of Nadine's ex-husband, Jim Smith. There, Nadine held Cindy Bailey in a chair at gunpoint, taunting her by pointing the gun at her head. Jim Smith attempted to talk her out of it. He talked to Greg and said, Greg, you've got to stop your mother. Jim Smith left the house, but Greg and Teresa stayed behind with Nadine. She shot Cindy Bailey. Nadine handed the gun to her son, Greg. While he was reloading the gun, she jumped on the neck of Cindy Bailey. Nadine was essentially out of control. What happened was an act of pure defensive anger about this woman being threatening to her son. Nadine fired several more shots into the body of Cindy Bailey. The young woman was shot five times in the chest twice in the head and once in the back before she finally died. Nadine put the gun in Cindy Bailey's hand and they left. The body of Cindy Bailey was found by Jim Smith and his neighbors when Jim returned to the house. I have had several homicides in the hall I was sheriff, but this was one of the worst. There was blood all over the house. Miss Smith and her son fled the area and they were later uh, captured in the Telequad area. The mother and son denied everything, but Teresa Baker cracked under interrogation. It wasn't too long before she told us what had happened. Nadine was charged with murder in first degree, and so was her son, Greg. Nadine Smith went on trial in December 1982. Prosecutor Michael Daffin felt confident he would get her the death penalty. Their defense was to blame Teresa Baker. It was Teresa who did it all. There was overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Nadine Smith was the one who was giving orders. She was mean Nadine. Nadine also had uh, a history of brain injury. She had this problem of controlling emotions when provoked. But evidence of Nadine's mental health problems was never presented in her defense. And the most damning piece of evidence for the prosecution was provided by Nadine herself. A letter that Nadine Smith had written to her son, Greg. In it, she says, if they ask if I jumped on her throat, it wasn't me, it was Teresa. The note was coaching Greg as to what to say or not to say. 
It was very incriminating. As each juror read that note, they would pass it on to the next juror, and they would sit there and glare at Nadine. I knew, without a doubt, they were going to convict her, and they did. In later appeals, Nadine claimed the trial was flawed because she shared the same lawyer as her son. The lawyer would make decisions protecting the son and at the, to the detriment of the mother. Greg Smith was tried in Muskogee County and was sentenced to life in prison. I fully feel that Mrs. Smith got what she deserved. I defy anybody to read the transcript of this trial and not be outraged by what Nadine Smith did to Cindy Bailey. The death penalty was the appropriate penalty. Nadine Smith was put on Oklahoma's death row, where she lived for six years before being joined by Marilyn Plants in 1989. Marilyn Plants was born in 1960. She grew up in a country town near Oklahoma City. She was always a fairly quiet, reserved kind of girl. At the age of 16, Marilyn left secondary school and married 22-year-old Jim Plants. The couple soon had two children, Trina and Chris. Jimmy and Marilyn had a perfect marriage. You never seen them fight. Jim Plants worked in the Daily Oklahoman press room since he was a teenager, and he was working nights. He was a wonderful father and husband. Just a real outgoing, busy all the time guy. Absolutely loved his kids. But Jim Plants had no idea what his wife of 11 years was up to while he was at his night job. She had been leaving the kids at night and going out. 27-year-old Marilyn was leading a double life, partying with a younger crowd. She met Bryson about spring of 1988, started uh, dating him beginning of August. She's talking about getting rid of her husband. Our anniversary's next week. Oh, 11, 11 years? Clifford Bryson was 18 years old and had a police record for petty crimes. Bryson was easily manipulated. She bought him clothes and she bought him alcohol. The lovers hatched several plots to kill Marilyn's husband. Bryson recruited a friend to help with the murder, 18-year-old Clinton McKimble. On the night of the 26th of August, Marilyn gave the go-ahead. Marilyn decided that uh, they were going to kill him tonight. Hand each of them a baseball bat. At four o'clock that morning, while the children were sleeping, the three conspirators waited for Jim Plants to come home from work. When they hear the key in the door. Jim was whistling as he came in, has his groceries. They come from behind with the two baseball bats and attacked him. And they just hit him a bunch of times in the head. Marilyn stayed in her bedroom until Jim had been beaten unconscious. She comes out and says, that doesn't look like any accident. It was quite a bloody scene at that point. So Marilyn says, you're going to have to, to burn him. Bryson and McKimble drove Jim in his pickup truck to a secluded area, where they staged a fiery accident. They poured gasoline on him and in the interior of the car and lit it. As they're driving away, McKimble says he looks back he sees Jim Plants raise up. He raised up, opened the driver's door, stuck out his foot before he was consumed by the flames, fell back over, and, and perished. One hour later, Jim Plants' vehicle was still burning when the police arrived at the scene. Foul play was immediately suspected. They could tell by the intensity of the fire. Jimmy's dead. Jim Plants' family rushed to comfort his wife, Marilyn, but the police were already suspicious of the young widow. She just was just odd. She wasn't giving them the impression that they expect a 
wife to have after losing her husband. When Women on Death Row continues. It was cold and calculated. It makes you think if this is not a death penalty case, what is? And later. A clemency appeal is really an appeal for mercy. On the 26th of August, 1988, 33-year-old family man, Jim Plants, was savagely beaten and burnt to death. The police didn't know who'd committed the horrific murder, but they had suspicions about Plants' 27-year-old wife, Marilyn. Investigators noticed some warning signs. She kept changing her story, which is a classic sign of... When the police searched her home, they found chilling evidence of Jim Plants' final hours. The carpet was soaked with blood. I found two baseball bats. Both of them contained blood. Marilyn was arrested on the 29th of August and charged with first-degree murder. Her accomplices, Clifford Bryson and Clinton McKimble, were picked up a day later. When they told us Marilyn was a suspect, we all thought, it can't be. She wouldn't do something like that. Not Marilyn. I mean, she was like a sister. The motive for this particular crime was money. Marilyn had him increase his insurance policy from $30,000 to approximately $300,000. It was cold and calculated. It makes you think if this is not a death penalty case, what is? The trial began in March 1989. Despite the defense team's requests, the judge ordered that Marilyn Plants and her teenage boyfriend, Clifford Bryson, be tried together. Clinton McKimble, their accomplice, agreed to give evidence against them in exchange for life in prison. Her defense was the guys did it. She wasn't involved. It was total denial. Maybe she wasn't the one holding the bat or the can of gas, but she instigated it. Marilyn Plants was transferred to death row, joining Nadine Smith. Another woman, Wanda Jean Allen, would be locked up with them just one month later. Wanda Jean Allen grew up in the uh, northeast part of Oklahoma City. Her family situation was probably not, definitely not the best in the world. A lot of drug abuse, a lot of domestic violence. Wanda Jean had a very explosive temper. She would just go off just at any time. Age 21, Wanda Jean Allen was involved in a shooting death. She killed a woman and had pled guilty to manslaughter. Wanda served four years in prison for the manslaughter of Dietra Pettis. While behind bars, she met a fellow inmate, Gloria Leathers. After they were both released, they actually were lovers. Living together. They had a stormy relationship. We had been out to the house on numerous occasions because of fights. On the afternoon of the 1st of December, 1988, Wanda Jean and Gloria had another heated argument. A dispute arose over Gloria's welfare check. Apparently, Wanda wanted possession of it, and Gloria did not want her to have it. The dispute continued back at the couple's home. Gloria Leathers had decided to leave Wanda Jean that day. Gloria's mother had come over to, to help Gloria move out. Wanda was not happy about this and told her that if she couldn't have her, no one could have her. Gloria and her mother got in the car. Wanda Jean followed them in her vehicle. Uh, they pulled up in front of the police department. Wanda Jean had a gun with her. She confronted Gloria in the parking lot of the police department and shot her once in the stomach. A police officer heard the gunshot. He saw Wanda Jean Allen running with a gun in her hand. She jumped in her vehicle and took off. Laura Lewis suffered a severe gunshot wound to the abdomen. 29-year-old Wanda Jean eluded the police for four days until they received an anonymous tip-off. She was arrested 70 miles south of Oklahoma City. 
just before we started the official interview, I advised her of her rights again for the second time. And I told her, received a call from Mercy Hospital and Gloria's passed away. She died about 20 minutes ago. You want me to get you some tissue? I think Wanda Jean Allen had a lot of remorse uh, about the crime. She loved Gloria. Wanda Jean was charged with murder. And lawyer Robert Carpenter was hired to defend her. State prosecutors then announced that they would seek the death penalty for Allen. Bob Carpenter had never tried a death penalty case before. He asked the judge to recuse himself from the case, and the judge refused. Her defense at trial was self-defense. She argued that uh, Gloria had a garden rake and struck her with it. I asked her, was she going to come back home, you know? What happened? She had got out with the thing in her hand. So I opened the door and I got the gun. I wasn't going to let her hurt me. She tried to bring up something about a hand rake. We didn't see one in the car. According to later appeals, Wanda Jean's lawyer made a crucial error during the trial. Wanda Jean had an IQ of 70, so she was borderline mentally retarded. Her attorney did not even introduce into the trial her mental impairments. He wasn't able to hire a mental health expert. Wanda Jean had frontal lobe brain damage, but a jury never got to hear those things. Wanda Jean Allen was imprisoned on death row next to Nadine Smith and Marilyn Plants. My duty was to visit the death row inmates on a weekly basis. When I met Wanda Jean, it was a very cold reception at first. Into the fourth year, something changed with Wanda. She was reading her Bible and she said, what does this mean and what does this mean? The prison chaplain, Don Duncan, ministered to the women on death row for years. Nadine looked like a nice grandmother, a very pleasant, polite person. Marilyn had this shy personality about her. And Wanda was kind of the humorous one. And we would study the scriptures. We never talked about their crime. Very seldom would we talk about their families. It was very painful for them to talk about their children and what they had done. In September of 2000, a local pastor baptized all three of them. They became a very close group to the point that they changed it. This is not death row anymore. This is life row. But that same year, the courts denied the final appeals of Wanda Jean Allen, Marilyn Plants, and Nadine Smith. The women of Oklahoma's death row had run out of time. We began to receive word that in the very near future, all three would be executed. Wanda Jean Allen was scheduled to be executed first. A clemency hearing would be her final opportunity to escape the death penalty. Clemency hearings are, are highly charged proceedings. We are arguing on behalf of the state to carry out the sentence that was imposed by the jury. The defendant is trying to convince them to spare her life. A clemency appeal is really an appeal for mercy. It's not a retrial. Local minister Robin Myers appealed to the clemency board on Wanda Jean's behalf. I simply said, Wanda Jean has become a really good person in prison. She knows what she did was wrong. We just want to try to get her life in prison without parole. The defense team also asked that Wanda Jean's mental impairment be considered. But the state argued that she knew enough to be accountable. She had a job. She functioned in society. She paid the bills. She could function just fine. I think she knew right from wrong. Wanda Jean was invited to address the clemency board and make a plea in her own words. She sat down and, in my opinion, the wheels came off. She couldn't articulate what she wanted to say. She was extremely emotional. It was very difficult for her to speak. She apologized to the families of the victims. I'm very 
when Wanda Jean was denied clemency, I lost all hope. She was devastated. Just no way to, to describe it except she was devastated. When Women on Death Row continues. Wanda Jean really believed right up to the very end that her life was going to be spared. She deserved just as much mercy as she had shown him, which was absolutely not. And later. You don't want to believe that that kind of evil exists. In 2001, three women were on death row in Oklahoma. Nadine Smith, Marilyn Plants, and Wanda Jean Allen. Their appeals had been exhausted, and Wanda Jean Allen was about to become the first woman to be executed in Oklahoma since statehood in 1907. There was a big protest that, that had been planned. The largest anti-death penalty march that's ever occurred in the United States. The executions take place in McAllister, Oklahoma, at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. The Supreme Court was asked one last time to stay the execution. They did not. Her lead attorney, Steve Presson, had to say to Wanda Jean on the phone, we cannot help you anymore. There was a long, long pause, silence on the other end of the phone, because Wanda Jean really believed right up to the very end that her life was going to be spared. Wanda Jean Allen was escorted to the execution chamber on the evening of the 11th of January. It's kind of somber mood all over the prison. If the inmates well respected uh, at the time of the execution, a lot of the offenders on death row, they'll start banging on the door. That's their way of saying goodbye. Approximately 30 minutes before the execution, they'll start securing the offender on this gurney. Most families want to witness executions because it's the last thing that they can physically do for their loved one. 26 members of the victim's families came to McAllister to witness the execution of Wanda Jean Allen. We walked into this room, those blinds opened up, and you could see Wanda Jean laying on, on the gurney. I'm at the head of the gurney. I'm probably 18 inches from her head. We were able to talk with each other. For the warden asked her, uh, do you have a last statement? She raised her head up and said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. The first drug that is administered puts them to sleep. The second drug will stop the diaphragm, uh, and, and then the third drug will um, kill the heart and the brain. Once the process has begun, it, it usually takes about five minutes. We have a team on standby to save the offender for any last, last minute stays. She raised her head up, looked over at us, stuck her tongue out, and that was it. She was gone. Wanda Jean Allen did not deserve to be executed, in my opinion, because no one deserves to be executed from a moral standpoint. That didn't balance the scales of justice. Not a single member of the victim's families said, please execute Wanda Jean. Justice was served in Wanda Jean's case. She had killed before. She's the type of person that the death penalty is intended for. Marilyn Plants was scheduled to follow Wanda Jean Allen to the death chamber. Her accomplice, Clifford Bryson, had already been executed in June 2000. After we gave Marilyn her 30-day notice, she said, Chaplain, can you teach me how to study the Bible for myself? The clemency hearing for Marilyn Plants took place on the 17th of April 2001, two weeks before her execution date. She said, I take the full responsibility of what happened to Jim. I felt like she deserved just as much mercy as she had shown him, and which was absolutely not. 
Marilyn's daughter, now aged 21, pleaded for her mother's life to be spared. Marilyn Plants's uh, attorneys pushed the argument of, well, you know, this is the only parent these kids have. Therefore, grant her clemency. I was hurting for Trina. Trina didn't want her mother to be executed. She said, Chaplain, I want you to read these scriptures. The rich man and Lazarus in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. The inmate has up to two minutes to make a last statement. I try to prepare families um, for the fact that they may not even acknowledge uh, the victim or the victim's family members. She knew we were there, but she didn't say anything to us. I began to read the scriptures that she asked. The doctor is at the end of the gurney. Whenever that monitor shows that there is no longer life, he will stand up and pronounce her dead. Marilyn died long before I finished those two short passages, but he did not stand up. He let me read those. Until the day that they executed her, I harbored that hatred and that, that passion to, to see justice done. And when they finally had the execution, to me, it was over. It's done. I have forgiven Marilyn because you've got to forgive to move on with your life. But I won't ever forget. It'll always be with me. I think about my brother all the time. No, I couldn't forgive her. After Marilyn's execution, I said, I no longer can do this. I began to have nightmares. Jean thought that God had saved her for the last to help Wanda Jean and Marilyn through their executions. Nadine's lawyer, Gregory Pichet, faced the clemency board in a last ditch effort to save her life. I wanted to try to provide an explanation. How did this person come to do an act that was so violent and so inhumane. Nadine was very protective of her son, Greg. It resulted in an outrageous act. She was deeply remorseful about the pain that she'd caused. Nadine chose not to attend her own clemency hearing. She was absolutely convinced that there was no option for clemency. She had a lot less faith than, uh, than we did. She was right, we were wrong. On the 4th of December 2001, Nadine Smith walked the same route to the execution chamber as her friends Marilyn Plants and Wanda Jean Allen. We were given an opportunity to see her for the last time before the execution. We talked about uh, she was going to watch this football game from heaven. She was going to meet her Lord. She said her final words. She expressed her remorse to the family. Don Duncan had resigned as prison chaplain, but he kept a personal vigil as the woman he'd counseled for years was executed. I can remember looking at the clock about 20 minutes after, and I knew it was over with. Oklahoma has chosen to have the death penalty as a punishment. The people of Oklahoma voted that, and that's what they have chosen. We kill people to prove how wrong it is to kill people. We're not just killing a murderer. We're dealing with a human being. If you're a person of religious faith, you believe every human being has value and worth. What about the value of the victim's life? Isn't that worth something? It's a process that leaves a lot of victims with a lot of grief. Nobody. Nobody comes out clean. When you talk about justice being served for victims, there's going to be 
as many answers as you ask the question. For most family members that I work with, there is justice. The death penalty shows that we do have a lot of respect for human life. Um, in that we do give the ultimate penalty when you take another person's life. We spend a lot of resources, money, arguing whether somebody lives or dies. I think that there's a better way to spend that money and maybe look at putting it back into the, the communities that raise Wanda genes.